Mike Johnson. I'm Mick Gillespie. It's time for the All-American Report. We talk Alabama football. It's the bye week, but we got a lot to get into with Alabama and Georgia. And I'll tell you right out of the shoot, uh, 2008, I remember being in Athens for the blackout. You were on the field. It yeah. was the funeral, right? I, I've yeah. never seen – I'll tell you this. They had every single person in that stadium wearing black, which is unbelievable to me. Uh, it was so easy to find the Alabama fans, even though our color schemes are similar. And then, and then, of course, uh, they got Julio Jones and uh, Mark Ingram and, and everything else, and Alabama won the game. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They got Andre Smith. They got Antoine Caldwell. Come on, man. <laughs> Don't be – don't start all that. You, you got know, Mike you Johnson? Know how <laughs> Did you get Mike Johnston? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, and, and obviously, you know, living over here, it's been 16 years living over here in Atlanta and, and talking to Georgia fans pretty constantly, right? It's been unbelievable, the the legend that that game kind of carries uh, in, in Alabama and Georgia history, right? I mean, it, there's so much weight. You forget almost that Georgia beat Alabama the year before in overtime in a college game day game that had all of, you know, the ingredients to be an absolute classic because of what happened in 08. And the game didn't even – it wasn't even a blowout in the end. I mean, it was obviously a lopsided halftime score. Um, but Georgia, with as much talent as they had on that team, came storming back in the second half. But, Mick, I get questions about that game – all the time, dude. I mean, all the time. I actually, uh, I don't know. You might have been there. I went to uh, Kramer's or Lost Dog over here in Buckhead one day. Uh, this is probably eight years ago. And I ran into a guy that's wearing a black shirt and dark gray letters that said, Beat Bama. And I was like, dude, how much is it going to take me to buy that shirt off you? And he was like, I hate this shirt. And I was like, okay, cool. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy you a shirt from the bar. And I'm going to give you 20 bucks, and I'm taking that shirt home. And I still have that shirt hanging in my closet to this day, Mick. Still love that shirt. Did he realize who you were? No. So no, and it didn't matter, hey, man. man that, that, you didn't tell him why that shirt was so significant to you. You didn't give him the, hey, buddy, you know, um, that was one of the – that win to me, Mike, was when it, it, Saban had arrived. We weren't really sure. Remember going into the game, Georgia was a big favorite. They were, they were like, they were preseason ah, you know. number one. Preseason yeah, they, number one that year. That's right. Right. That's right. And um, they had all, I got barked at there by people a lot. You know, like it was uh, the, the, the downtown scene won me over. It was honestly, that game was one of the most fun nights of my life. Yeah. Because we just stayed out. We, we, we just, we, once the game was over, we never, we never went home. So yeah, fun. and everybody was nice. Like they invited us to their post game parties. Let me tell you how that night went for me after the game. Well, first of all, obviously the game was a lot of fun. Uh, which we would have, I wish we would have finished better in the game because I think they ended up coming back scoring like thirty in the second half or something crazy. Um, but because of how small the the airport is in Athens, we had to split up into three planes to fly home. We flew into Atlanta. I think we stayed in like Duluth or Sewanee or something up the mm -hmm. I-85 corridor over here. And then we drove to Athens the day of the game, but we left in Athens airport. So we had to split up into three smaller planes. I will never forget this night as long as I live. We all take off. We, we all got our seating assignments. We all take off on different planes. I, it might have it even have been four planes. Um, and we're descending, right? I can tell we're descending. We're cleared for landing. I'm looking out my window and I'm seeing tall buildings. And I was like, dude, this is not Tuscaloosa. And we hit the we hit the ground, we roll all the way in, and and the pilot goes, Hey, uh, turns out we had to stop for fuel in Birmingham. And I was like, Stop for fuel in Birmingham. Like, how 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 are we able to make it to Birmingham and not Tuscaloosa on a 30-minute freaking flight? And we sat on that tarmac for probably an hour and a half before we flew from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa. And at that point, Mick, when I landed and tried to make it to Harry's or whatever else was going on that night, all my friends were already lit. You know what I mean? They, they were, <laughs> that ship had already sailed. I missed the boat on the actual post-game celebration to the blackout game. But nonetheless... Still a pretty fun night, all things considered. Yeah, it sounds like we both had a great time. Uh, yeah, w where'd we go? The Bulldog? 
uh, we we did the show in 2015 from the Bulldog there. Yeah, it wasn't the that. Bulldog. What was that place called? The uh, I'll think of it in a minute. That uh, the same people that own the Lost Dog over there in Buckhead. Remember? Yeah, uh, yeah. Buddy Marshall over there. Yeah, Marshall. Uh, man. Hey, shout out to Marshall. The yeah, Lost good dog. dude, man. Hey, dude. Good um, dude. the bar I went to the blackout night that I remember the most though is the place that it was kind of like in the bottom of a building, and it had like a copper uh bar top. And it was great. Honestly, I, as much as I love Tuscaloosa's bar scene, that was the night I realized Georgia didn't win the football game, but they won the bar scene game. Yeah. Because it's they have so many more bars, and they're so, like, independent, man. It's just really cool themes. I don't know the names of all of them. What a great place, though. Like, Athens is a very, very cool hangout spot. Yeah. I actually, I, I heard a lot of people make, and I would be curious to know if anybody watching – I heard a lot of people compare Madison, Wisconsin to Athens a little bit. Yeah. Um, same vibe, same kind of bar feel, cool downtown. You know, it's not not a huge town, but just a good college town with a with a good scene. So yeah, man. I, I going back in 2015, that was the that was that was cool for me because I had been to Georgia, Alabama games. I'd played in one, I attended the one in 2012, the SEC title game, the one where they uh, you know the guy slips on like the four yard line or six yard line or whatever it is. Um, but you remember that 2015 uh, 15 game we went to, first of all, biblical rain showers. I mean, absolute ridiculous as far as the amount of, of rain that came down, but Georgia was favored when that game opened. Do you remember that? Yeah. It was like the first time in the regular season that Bama was not favored, like five years leading up to that or something crazy. Um, and Georgia was actually favored in that game and was talking trash on the field. When Bama ran out of the tunnel, it was yeah. the craziest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, we do we do the show with Coker. You know, he's on the tailgate show, right. Elephant in the Room here on uh, uh, Cover Crimson. And guys, thanks for hanging out with us on Cover Crimson, by the way. Make sure you're a subscriber to CoverCrimson.com and, uh, and be a part of what we're doing here, and we appreciate you. Coker w- talks about it all the time. And then we have Ryan Anderson on. He said they came out, they were talking uh, a you know a bunch of smack to like that defensive line. And you remember that defensive line. I mean, it wasn't just Ryan. I mean, it was it that that was an one of the best defensive lines ever. And I think Coker said he looked over and saw that and he was like, Man, these guys don't know what they're getting into. Yeah. Alabama had what I'd say this, man. Th- this is just my opinion. I, one of the weaknesses Saban had was f- those years where you didn't know who was going to be the quarterback. And, and kind of not knowing who to give the quarterback job to. And that was the year that it happened. And then when they finally settled on Coker, who you know, in my opinion, should have been the quarterback the year before. Because we were on the shows talking about that every single week uh, yeah. the year before. I like guys that can – I just like quarterbacks that can vertically challenge you with the pass. I think I think that – like even like with Milrow, it keeps you you honest as a defense – knowing that if you make a mistake, this guy's going to hit you over the top. And, and it, it changes the way that you can can really play defense when you have to worry about that. Right. Uh, Coker was great at it. By the end of his career, he was, uh, you know, by the time we saw him in that national championship game, killing it. But this was kind of his breakout game, even though he was just handing the ball off to Derrick Henry and, and kind of just managing things the way that they wanted him to do it. Going in there to that 2015 game, Georgia was favored. We all hung out together. We did our pregame show together there. Uh, and that's the place, the Bulldog Bar, or whatever whatever it was. We were there. I sat with uh, one of your childhood friends, um, Dome. guy yeah, that we Justin Domarco, yeah. Dome, because go, goes by Dome. And his wife. And his dad. Uh, yeah. And it rained, and then we did the postgame show from your RV. You remember yeah. that? We, yeah. did, we did like the little RV table. So I had to walk out of that place. The water was coming down so heavy. I just Dude. gotten a new pair of cowboy boots and they were soaked. They fit perfectly. They have ever since. And I remember that game because of how great those cowboy boots are. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a story about the rain in that one. I was, first of all, got in the stadium and I was with Baron Huber, our buddy, and I was three sheets and I mean three sheets. <laughs> and I had a jack, a frog tog jacket on, but it was still pouring. And to the point where I was, it, it, I had had so much to drink. I high fived Baron so hard on a, on, I think it was a Derek Henley, uh, a long run up the middle that my national championship ring that I was wearing 
flew off and flew probably 20 rows down below me and hit a kid, hit a kid. And here's the best part. The kid picked it up, raises it up in the air. And I was like, I didn't even know it was gone. I just, my, my finger got cold all of a sudden. So the kid raises up and is like, Hey, did anybody drop a ring? And I was like, Oh my God. And I was like, Oh, I like looked down. And uh, everybody was just kind of looking at me like, dude, is that a national title ring? Just got flung 20 rows down. And I was like, sorry, like real hard high five, man. Like, you know, just, <laughs> just knocked it out. But I was like, thank God some kid saw it and was like, oh, I need to get this guy's national title ring back. That would not have been a good day, man. Not have been a good day. And that, that brings me up to that championship game in 2015. I've, I've told this story to Coker many times on our different shows. I sat with you and Baron Huber. Yeah. Never a more physical football game watch than than you two with the high fives uh ring flying high fives pats on the back that i felt like your hand was going to come through my chest to the other side yeah um i you know i walked out of there battered and bruised when Kenyon drake <laughs> went in for that last touchdown i got up and got away from you guys because i knew that, that it was <laughs> where our little <laughs> friend ron was it felt sorry for him too like that is a physical watch but it's fun though yeah, my buddy Agen uh, was there too. He's he's some would call vertically challenged, and uh, I sat with him uh, last year at the SEC title game. And I, I we're we're celebrating. You know, obviously we're in the mix of a million Georgia fans, and uh, so I I've been at both those games with Agen, and I said, hey, can, I turned around, Georgia fan. I said, hey, can you get a picture of us? And he could tell that we had you know we had been drinking, and so he turns the the video button on, and at that point I just shoulder checked Agen. I mean, just bam. And he went flying and landed on the leg of some guy next to him. I mean, right there, like, you know, 40 yard line, like 20 rows up. I still have the video. I showed it to my wife. She was like, that's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. Can't yeah. believe y'all act like that. I was like, I don't care. That was one of the best wins that I've ever been present for. <laughs> it's not y'all. It's it's mostly you guys. <laughs> <You're embarrassing. laughs> oh, man. The other thing that I'll tell you guys, too, like what we should give away a watch with you. You know, for, as like, like a gift for somebody. Like we all go sit in the stands at a big game just in some way because it would be an experience for them. Yeah. The other thing that Mike does that when you're watching football with him is that he knows football way better than all of us. So anytime something happens and you're yelling, you better be getting it right because you, you, <laughs> you're not mean about it, but you'll just kind of be like, hey, bro. Uh, what happened on that was yeah. tight end didn't slide over. The running back's supposed to go in that gap there, and they left the right tackle on an island, and then he's got to block two guys. So it's not the yeah. – it, he, he just looks like shit right now, but it's not his fault. And then yeah. you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to cheer. <laughs> <laughs> I had I remember having that conversation with somebody when me and you were at Rounders, and like, man, it's a it's a, it's a three-man rush, three-on-five rush. How, does it, how did they possibly get home three-on-five? And I was like, well – for one guy, it's not a three-on-five rush. There's two double teams, and then one guy just one-on-one -on -one like he is every other play. So if he gets beat, and it's just it doesn't matter if it's three-on-five, you know. I just uh, I, I do have a very specific way of watching football. There is no doubt about that. Yeah, it's it's fun though. Uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, a chance to get together and do it in person. What I want to tell you guys though is that uh, this show, the All American Report, is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code Next Round. Uh, to double your initial deposit. That's right. My bookie will double your initial deposit when you use the promo code next round. Kick off the football season with mybookie.ag and double your initial deposit by using the promo code next round. Um, so back to 2009, Bama or 2008, Bama lost the year before, beat them in, in 2008. And since then, I mean, I feel like Alabama has been the dominant team in this series. Uh, not just because they're what five and one, but also because uh, they make the big plays when they have to. The game that Georgia won was a year where Alabama had beaten them, you know, two games beforehand, and they got all the breaks. And that happens in this in sports, you know, where you, you certain players get hurt. Uh, honestly, Alabama got those same breaks last year when you talk about Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey being injured. But but to me, I just don't understand this. How are we going to sit around and talk about Georgia when it's been Alabama that's dominated this series? But every time it, this game comes up, Vegas takes Georgia. The, the media takes Georgia. With that said, things have shifted a little bit because of the way that Georgia played against Kentucky. 
Yeah, they have. Uh, and I was reading this this morning when we were doing the radio show over here in Atlanta. I was reading that, you know, uh, Georgia is no longer, in terms of ESPN and everything else, the power index and projections, no longer projected to go undefeated, which I think is uh, a panic button in, in a lot of different ways for some Georgia fans over here. And you got the injury to Tate Ratledge, who was there, you know, he had the tightrope procedure that Tua had. He's like, he's their offensive line captain. You just don't seem to have the set of skill players lined up out wide that you have in the past. And Mick, I got to tell you, it's not only about the fact that Bama has dominated the series. You go back most of the time, most of the time. I mean, this is after 2008. You know, you got 2012, you got 2015, you got 2017, you got 2020. Most of the time that Bama has won this game, Bama has also won a national title. Um, you know, that's not the same as last year. Uh, obviously, you you uh, won the SEC championship and did not win a national title. But go back to all the times they played, you know, the four or five times before that, that Bama has won this game and won a national title uh, in the same season a lot of times. So it's definitely, look, I got a lot of respect for the Georgia program. I'm not going to sit here and act like I don't. Um, I've been around it a lot. I, I do. I still love Kirby Smart. I love everything they've been able to do. Um, but there, there is a certain hump that they definitely they understand that they need to get over. And I think that obviously they smell blood in the water when it comes to Coach Saban no longer being there. And I think that that goes back to a couple of things. First and foremost, this isn't Georgia's not the style of team that Nick Saban had problems with most of the time. I mean, you go back to like the LSU Les Miles teams. Yes, they beat Bama a couple times, but that's not the games that you really were scared about. If you were, it was the Johnny Manziel teams, it was the Hugh Freeze Ole Miss teams, it was the you know Auburn or Gus Malzahn. Those are the times you used to get nervous when Nick Saban was coaching. Not not so much these pro style you know uh, quarterbacks and, and and big offensive lines. So I do think that there is is Georgia smelling blood in the water a little bit, but. I think uh, there is something to be said about fear of the unknown if you're if you're a Georgia fan right now and part of that Georgia program because it's not like Kalen DeBoer can't draw up offensive plays. And there is a chance that Bama ends up more explosive offensively this year than they have in a number of years. So I think that's also something to be fearful about uh, if you're if you're a Georgia fan. So I, I'm I'm I am looking forward to this next chapter. Uh, win or lose on Saturday, next Saturday. I don't think that'll tell really the entire story of this next chapter of Alabama versus Georgia. No, but you know what? It will tell us where this Alabama program is. One thing that we saw at Wisconsin is that DeBoer is not going to be afraid to try to score. He's not going to be conservative like Coach Saban. I think the defense isn't going to be as good. I know Kane Womack has done a, a, a he's off to a great start, and I'm not. Don't get me wrong, but he's not Nick Saban. Okay. The, the adjustments aren't going to be as good. It just is impossible. That's it, it, it just is. And I know Womack comes from a family of, you know, his dad's a great defensive guy. Don't get me wrong, but we all know that. But the offense, it's just different. And and when they block for Milrow, you can tell already the fact that they're doing things with glad. We, how many years did we scratch our heads and say, why aren't we running the damn ball? Right. Yeah. When you had a team that could run the ball, we would just be throwing it. We had there was a rotating, revolving door of offensive coordinators. Every time you turn around, we got another guy at the as that that's an offensive coordinator. Some of them were good. Some of them were OK. Uh, they all seem to win because of Nick Saban. Now it's like this is pretty this is going to be pretty consistent. You know, Milrose not getting sacked as much. Um, when when Alabama got the ball at the end of the first half against Wisconsin, they went for the jugular and they got it. They they ended the game effectively right there, which kind of reminded yep. me a little bit of that last touchdown that Bama got uh, at the half against Georgia in 2008. Wasn't it like a Julio Jones pass right at the end of the first half? I, th I think you're right. Um, I can remember just about every touchdown from that first half of football. I know Roy Upchurch scored on a – uh, a draw. I think Glenn scored on a like a, a guard. I, I pulled out left to the left flat. We scored on mm -hmm. an inside zone with I think Mark Ingram or Glenn or somebody else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm with you. Here's the thing that I would challenge you on just a little bit though, okay. with, with what there. you just said. I would argue that it's been a number of years since we saw that version of Nick Saban's defense that you're talking about. He's not he's not Nick Saban, but neither was Pete Golding and neither was Tosh Lapoy. 
right? So I, I'm with you. Like Nick is the goat. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Especially when you talk about collegiate defenses, there is nobody that understood better how to stop offenses. But I think he struggled at time with, like we said, the Hugh Freeze, the Gus Malzahn's, the spread attacks that you, you you've seen for a number of years in college football because it's so rule driven that once a coach started understanding what those rules were offensively, they could take advantage of it. And right. I think that I think there's something to be said for just kind of dumbing it down just a little bit. If you're Kane Womack and kind of playing that style, conversely, you're you're opening it up. Uh, you know, if you're Nick Sheridan and and and, and Kalen DeBoer offensively, what you're looking. At. The thing that I learned last week in the Wisconsin game is that this offense has bought into the quarterback run game. Yes. There is no doubt. Like they have completely and wholeheartedly bought in to Jalen Milrow as a runner. Empty backfield, not empty backfield, uh, pistol, shotgun, whatever it is, you get an added dimension when you can motion and go four wide to the strong side of the field and run like a, a weak side counter play into the boundary. And there's nobody over there because you don't have anybody in coverage on the left side of the formation. You know what I mean? So it just uh, there's there's so many different things you can do X's and O's wise. Um, you know, to to make this offense challenging. And when you throw down the field the way Jalen Milrow did uh, last weekend, I just don't know. I, and, and the thing is, Mick, what's exciting about next weekend to me is that we talk all that we used to talk, you and I used to talk all the time. The pro style quarterbacks, I don't know that pro style quarterbacks are ever going to beat Nick Saban's defense. I don't know. I don't think, you know, pro mm -hmm. style quarterback, this, that, and the other. I think that a lot of people think the same way about Kirby Smart's defense. And guess what? We don't have a pro-style quarterback anymore. Jalen Milrow ain't a pro-style quarterback. I think he can do a nice job of exposing some of the weaknesses like he did last year in that SEC title game. But I think it'll be even more opened up. I think it'll be design runs more than it is scrambles Right. Uh, you know, next weekend when they take on Georgia. Yeah, dude, that is a great point, man. I mean, in this, we'll see what happens. But this is really interesting kind of looking at it. Um you know, because all Kirby's done is just take Nick Saban's blueprint and move it to Athens. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Now, the last thing I want to get into on this show is um, the entire SEC. It's different now with Texas and Oklahoma. It's different with Ole Miss actually being a really good team. Is this a battle of the two best teams in the SEC? Or is this a battle of, you know, two of the elite teams in the SEC? Well, it's definitely a much more difficult question to answer now that Texas and Oklahoma are part. And I'll move Oklahoma to the side for now. I think that I think they've got their hands full this weekend. Um, I did see – it's funny because I, I, I just saw – I was talking about this morning. Arch Manning now has the same Heisman odds in DraftKings as Quinn Ewers does. Like, they, they think that highly of Arch Manning after that, uh, you know, half or three-quarters of football that he played. No, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not so sure that Tennessee is not the best team in the SEC right now. And if you're a Bama fan watching this and you're rolling your eyes, you're going, dude, that's ridiculous. Um, but there are teams, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll name three of them, and it's not shocking because I think they're all in the top ten. Tennessee is playing with a physicality at the line of scrimmage that we just haven't seen from Tennessee in a long time. Like, they've had good linemen. They've had good lines. As a, as a total unit, though, absolutely throwing people up front on both sides of the ball. And you add Nico Iamaliava to that equation and everything he is able to do, I'm not so sure as it stands right now that Tennessee is not the best team in the SEC. They play Bama and they play Georgia, so we will find out by the end of the year. Let me piggyback that by saying Ole Miss is getting some of the best defensive play, defensive line play, that I think that program's ever gotten. And I'm talking about ever. They've had some good ones. But when you look at the transfers they brought in on the defensive line, it's unbelievable the way they are playing defensively up front. I think that's going to be a tough test. And then obviously Texas. I think nobody's when you look at talking Texas, about Tennessee. I'm sorry, nobody's talking about Tennessee. I, I'm just telling you, Tennessee and Ole Miss are getting brands of football played in the trenches right now that you have not seen from them. They've they the the hypo and the Lane Kiven offense have been very finesse offenses for a while, right? Do a number of things with the quarterback. You saw it with Hendon Hooker and everybody else. I'm just telling you, 
I, there, there are teams. Tennessee could have not thrown the ball against NC State and won that game. Uh, when you go, when you go back and look at it, so I just I'm looking down the road, and these schedules are all so different than they have been in years past. And I look at the fact that Tennessee is going to get their shot to be the top dog, and I'm just telling you that is a terrifying, terrifying team to try to defend. I mean, it's what did they roll up 500 yards on the mm-hmm. ground last week? And I know it's Kent State. Okay, I get it, but that's not always that easy to do. I Texas, Tennessee, and Ole Miss. And I don't think Ole Miss is quite on that level yet, but they all have a claim right now to being the best team in the SEC. And I, I think that whoever wins this Alabama Georgia game is going to be in the front row seat to get into the SEC title game. But like I said, Tennessee is going to get their shot against both of them. You'll see Georgia go to Texas here in a few weeks. There's a number of games that are still left to kind of be played out. Not only that, on top of that, Mick, Ole Miss doesn't really play anybody. Ole yeah, Miss is. Ole Miss might moonwalk into the SEC title game. <laughs> like yeah. they, they, this is a perfect year for them to have this schedule with no divisions because they're like, oh, not our problem, not our problem. We don't play anybody. We're just going to beat everybody on our schedule, and um, they definitely can. It's like when they made the schedules, they wanted to put the marquee teams in big matchups, yeah. and they just didn't see Ole Miss as that. And so Ole Miss kind of got the third tier schedule. You know, where Alabama's got to play at Oklahoma the week before the Iron Bowl. Bama's still playing LSU. They got to go up, up play Tennessee, yep. you know, and uh, you're right, man. It's crazy. Um, because it's, 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 schedule- it's crazy to think, Mick, you, you, you realistically now, I mean, this is not that far out of the realm of possibility. You realistically could have like an Ole Miss Mizzou, like SEC title game. And I mean, <laughs> I, it's just like it's because I mean I, I don't think I don't think Mizzou's that team and their schedule is a little bit more difficult, but they're not they're not bad. Uh, and so they could if they win the right handful of games, I, these other teams are just knocking each other off. I feel like and it's going to happen at a high level. Hopefully, Bama can just keep the keep the train rolling. The All American Reports brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code Next Round to double your initial deposit. That's right, MyBookie will double your initial deposit when you use the promo code Next Round. Kick off the football season with MyBookie.ag and double your initial deposit. Uh, guys, hang out with us right here. Cover Crimson. Make sure that you give us a thumbs up. Share with your friends. You know, to, like get the word out. We need your help as we build this this new channel. And then also we invite you to CoverCrimson.com. That's our message board. That's where we kind of like the headquarters for uh, for things. And uh, you right now, if you subscribe, get the annual membership, you get the Cover Crimson T-shirt for free. And we'll get that out to you pretty fast. Mike, uh, great job today. Next week we have uh, it's it right now. No one. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm seeing that not a whole lot of people care about Alabama and Georgia. Once Saturday's over Sunday, watch out yeah i'm just telling you right now it's going to be it's already actually i was talking to my buddy rusty menzel who works at dogs hq it's already georgia hate week for me like i'm already, i'm already <laughs> suited and booted um I'm, i i would trust me if you're if you're living in alabama and you wonder what's going on in georgia just know i'm carrying the flag over here baby i'm holding it down very very firm over here in the city of atlanta all right roll tight everybody talk to you again soon